Hi everyone, it's so nice to see you all joining us live for this interview. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Molly and I work with Leslie as part of Pure and I was meant to be here last week but I wasn't very well so thank you everyone for your emails and all your messages to me, that was really really kind. But we're back now and we're with Angela and we're going to have a really good look around her studio and find out more about her and her artist story which I gather is really really interesting, Leslie's been telling me and we're going to have a look at some of your work as well. So hello Angela. Hello, hello Molly and everybody else. Nice to be here. Yeah, we've got we've got great. The comments are going already, aren't they? <laughs> In the group chat. <laughs> um, so first of all, where, where are you answering? Uh, well, listening to this interview from whereabouts are you? In your studio, um, it looks beautiful. Well, my studio is a wooden summer house in my garden in Horsham in England. And I have a studio out in Abruzzo in Italy, which I also have kitted out, but not quite as, as country style as this. Oh, that sounds amazing. How often do you go out to mm. Italy to work in that studio? That's wonderful. Well, before we had COVID, about oh. five times a year, and then I take a group of students with me once a year. So, uh, uh, and, and I, like out there we, we sketch and all, you know, wonderful mountain scenes and things like that. Mm. Oh, that's fantastic. So it's almost like a residency for those for those other artists as well. Yes, that's right. Yes. It's that's fairly fantastic. informal and um, we have a great time, lovely wine, food, and we go out drawing and painting. And then at the end of it, we have a, a local show for the local people in the village. And they like that oh, too. The oh, mayor came to the last one. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, how brilliant. I think Leslie's going to show us very quickly before we get started your page in our magazine, which everyone mm -hmm. you'll be able to have a look at and the um, read the Art360 magazine button just at the bottom of the screen. Um, but Leslie's going to show it to us now. She is here, but she's just off screen at the moment. Here we are. So, Angela, would you like to tell us a little bit about your page and about some of the artwork that you've shown in our magazine? Okay, well, all these paintings were done this year and um, I'm trying to move my work a little bit. I'm, I always paint people, um, but I'm trying to move it a little bit more towards what I grandly call it, um, abstract expressionism. Um, and that's largely because I've had a lifetime of drawing people in various ways. Um, and I'm trying not to actually overcook everything. Uh, I have great difficulty keeping things simple. So um, where I'm going with this is trying to um, keep to my key principles of colour and shape and line and vector lines. Vector lines are important to me because they are telling the narrative that um, is, is behind all my paintings because I'm basically a narrative painter. Wonderful. Well, they, they definitely come across. I mean, the colour is the first thing that strikes you, isn't it, when you look at your work? That comes across yes. immediately. It's very, very beautiful. Colour is very important. And all my paintings, before I actually launch onto a main painting, um, I go through a number of processes. But one of them is something like this, where I have decided in a very small form uh, what my... Um, sorry, <laughs> I yes, decided sorry. in a very small way um, with crayons what my main colours are going to be. So by the time I actually come to work for real, um, I'm, I'm sticking to a sort of format that I've worked out. Um, That's fabulous. So you start with the small studies mm -hmm. and then add the colour and then you obviously, because you work with scale yes. quite a lot, don't you? I, I see some of your work's quite big, like that one behind you which I'm just yes. going to have a proper look at. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but when I'm um, working, actually drawing and things like that, I can work a lot bigger because I really like it when I can get my shoulders and my charcoal mm. out and, and you know, really get amongst it and, mm. and stop trying to be so nitty-pity. Pity. <laughs> it's hard, isn't it, to know when to stop? <laughs> Absolutely, you could carry on forever, yes. Wonderful. So, um, yes, just to reiterate, so that's um, Angela's page and that will be available for you all to have a look at. I think, Leslie, if you make um, Angela full screen and then we'll have a look into how you became an artist and your artist story. Because um, I heard you say earlier when we were in the green room, there's sort of two big aspects to your artist story and it's not a conventional way, which we love. Um, so yes. if you could just, yeah, your artist story, how you became an artist, when you knew you'd become an artist. Was it a okay. decision? Was it just always going to be? Well, 
no, I, I went to art school um, and decided to do graphic design, um, largely because my friends were doing graphic design. Fine art was never going to be on the cards. I wanted to earn money. Um, <laughs> so I was doing things in my graphic design days where I could bring in illustration. So things where they, they were telling a very simple story um, and and people used to say to me, yes, you do the final illustration because I used to tick it in, you know, with magic markers and all that sort of thing. And then they say, no, 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 we like your drawing, so you do it. So I went from, from many years as a graphic designer um, mm -hmm. working for London companies art, uh, as an art director and graphic designer. And then um, when I had children, it was easy for me to be a freelance. And it's great if you have a, a business like that, where you can work from the premises. I had a barn at home that I turned into a business. And, um, and that was great. Um, and then after a while, I decided that what a lot of my clients needed, as well as a design, was marketing. So I went off and I did a marketing degree. And for 12 years, I earned great money as a marketeer in marketing communications. Um, but that meant I was asking advertising agencies and design groups to do the thing that I really loved doing. Um, so I was in the background, I was still painting and drawing. And I want to show you something which, which gives you an idea of where I started from. So you've, I try not to get the reflections of the window in this. Um, now that is my snug at where I lived. And at that stage, I was very influenced by Ken Howard. Mm -hmm. um, and it was my son and my dog. And I put that in for the Sunday Times Best of British Watercolor competition. And I got accepted for the exhibition. Now, I just thought, oh, that's good. You know, that's nice. But a friend of mine who owned a gallery said, you know, that's a big deal, the fact that you actually got that in. Mm. So I, I thought, oh, perhaps it is a big deal. I don't know. So I carried on in my own sweet way, doing a bit more art along with the marketing and all those things I was doing. And I came up with paintings that were um, sort of, more like this they were they were sort of in a way naive art but at the same time they were not as abstract as I'm doing now um, and it started to prove quite popular I started to sell work I started to get commissions and then I went out to Italy um, on one of my um, wonderful holidays and I came across this painter and he's called Giovanni Marangi Mm -hmm. And it was an exhibition that I saw at the Castello d'Aragona, um, which was on the island of Ischia. And it was in June 20, 2000. So it says in this brochure. Now, he was doing things like this. And I walked into this wonderful room in an old castle. And um, the hairs on the back of my neck just went up. You know, when you have one of those those feelings that you think wow that's fantastic yeah. and it was the color it was the freedom of what he was doing um, that I just resonated with and I thought yes my strength has come from being a graphic designer why am I trying to be a fine artist who does things like Ken Howard when actually there's a lot of people out there doing it a lot better than I am so from that moment on I could see that strength for me was in going back to my graphic roots, but using oil paint and acrylics. And I also use um, wonderful pastels that I've got. Um, and so that's kind of the journey. And then from there, I felt, well, um, I need to push this now because I was getting everything but the kitchen sink in my paintings. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and I could, I could tell the story without being quite so explicit. I knew that. But boy, has it been a painful journey. And one of the things that people often say to me is, how did you arrive at your style? How do I get a style that I can own? And all I can say is, you go on a journey and you try different things. And I often get people say to me, 
oh, I can see sort of Medigliani in your paintings. I can see Gauguin. I can see, yes, you can, because I've been on a journey and I'm still going on that journey. And my latest paintings this year are probably the most abstract that I've ever done. But, you know, that's not to say that's where they'll stop. I think you're so right. And we were saying in the green room, weren't we, that it's, you think it's going to be like, I'm just going to become an artist and that's going to be my style forever. But like you say, yours yeah. evolved so much from your start to where you are now. And I think that's really exciting. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, now, perhaps I should talk a little bit about the way that I work. Um, oh, yes, please do, yeah. Because I always um, start off with an idea in my head. It's an idea, sometimes it's about unspoken communication not always but sometimes because i think 90 percent of what happens between people and i'm very very interested in the way that women react together yeah. and 90 percent of how we communicate with each other is unspoken and women have a sort of telepathy if you get in a group of women there is this sort of bond of um uh, knowing a little bit about how other people feel. And, um, and so I um, wanted to explore these ideas. So I start off with some of those ideas and I, I start to think about, for instance, the painting that I've just done that you can see in, I'll show you in a minute. Um, I just get some central characters. It was all about um, when all, everything goes a bit wrong, um, everybody wants a cup of tea. It's such a British thing to do. Let's have a cup of tea. So I start off thinking about the people that are in that painting. What are they doing? How are they feeling? Um, and then I start to get get a grouping. So there, there I've started to get the group together. It, wow. it may not quite stay like that. Um, I can be working small, I can be working large. Um, and then I start to think about the tones. And I find tones are incredibly important for me because they start to help me with the vector lines, which is my lines that are showing where the communication flows between people and the space between them. Because to me, space between people and shadows are vital. They, mm. are, um, they sort of lock a painting together. And then I start to think about the colors. And this is where I get out my lovely Caran d'Ache crayons. Um, and I start to think, yes, I'm, I'm doing tones. You see how I've just done a little thing up the top here. You can just see that. Wow. Um, it's going to be in purples and grays with an accent color of the oranges and yellows. Um, so most of my work is, um, is like that, you know, I've, I've I've got some larger examples here where I get expansive and I think about a grouping. Um, this painting is the one you can actually just about see behind me. This one, um, and it's it's a, a take on Adam and Eve, and mm -hmm. it's called Temptation. Mm -hmm. um, and I was trying to work out: Do I want his head over here? Do I want his head over up here? What sort of proportion do I want the people in? So I just start sketching and scamping, and I often work on tracing paper. This tracing paper, you can move bits of it around, and and then I I came to to this, which is not quite so easy for you to see because you can see through it, <laughs> um, and you can see that I wanted. You know, her head is here, but in my final painting, I've made her mm. slightly smaller because mm. I wanted her to be more submissive and not so dominant in the picture. So all this process that I'm going through here takes about three weeks. Um, and that three weeks is just the most wonderful three weeks. And people say to me, do, do you paint every day? Well, no, I don't paint every day, but I do plan and plot paintings every day and I love that three weeks um, and that's the time when some days I'll go go in and I'll, I'll um, think oh that was a great day and then another day I'll come out and I think no nah, that didn't work I've got to try something else um, but it's the important bit 
with my paintings because it's they either work or they don't uh, in my in my perception probably not someone else's <laughs> um, and the last painting I've done is always the one I'm in love with for a little bit you know I've always I always think ah oh, that's the best painting I've done <laughs> uh, uh, but then of course it wears off and I start to think about the next one um, but the, yes that is basically my process um, to because the the painting and, and how much paint I put on and whether it's oil or whether it's acrylic or whether it's pastel um, is the bit that actually takes the shortest amount of time um, and like you said earlier it's not always easy to know when it's finished um, but I still you know I still have um, times when I go back to my original very oh, representational wow stuff that's my two grandchildren inside the trampoline um, and I, I bought some wonderful pastels chalk pastels and I thought I'm gonna have a go at these because I hadn't used them for a long while so I did something very realistic often people said oh I like your realistic stuff you know why don't you do more of that but I, that's not where I want to be um, I'm trying to push my my feelings into not having to say so much um, not having to spell it out for people um, because the people I admire so much are the people who can do it with a with a line you know David Hockney you can draw like a dream um, and he has such clarity when he tries to portray something of what he's trying to do um, I, and that's I where I want to I can only thank you for that because not, not being um, an artist as myself anymore, that was fascinating just to be able to see, like you say, because you, you think these artists go into their house and, like you say, paint every single day and produce these works, but seeing it from that initial idea and then how much you play about with it, it's just so interesting. Yeah. I like, see everyone else in the comments as well is saying they just love that and seeing the simplicity of your drawings and how they evolve. So what's the sort of yeah. average time frame when, you, when you've got that artwork and you, like you say, decide to paint it on the, is it canvas behind you? How long does that take? Um, the shortest time. Well, it depends. That particular one, once I because I'd done all the preparatory drawing mm. and the color scheme and everything else, it probably took me a week to wow. to do it. Um, I I paint sometimes on canvas. I paint on wood, um, and that particular one I think was on paper. Um, so it, it really does depend. Um, and I don't even know what size I'm going to do it until I've I've sort of got there really, um, and um, and I still um, have the occasional flurry into pottery and oh. three dimensional bits, and you know <laughs> I think when you're a creative person, I think it doesn't matter what you do it with. I mean I've I I go out sketching a lot. Um, and I do actually sketch, do an awful lot of life drawing because underneath everything I do, um, you have to be good at drawing. And I know that I can sort of hear an audible sigh from people, oh no, I can't draw. Um, but uh, to me, drawing is very important. And the only way I've got better at drawing is to keep doing it. I mean, I go out with my sketchbooks, um, and my lovely Karen Dash, wow. and I do little things like that, sitting by the lake in Lake Lake Como, um, and I I just draw, and and it's not until you just keep drawing that you see I might even do something much simpler and could just go out with charcoal, and and draw some village houses, um, and I do do a lot of life drawing. I think one of the best bits of life drawing I ever did was to draw the Royal Ballet. They were practicing Manon at, um, in London. And I was able to go and sit in the stalls and draw them practicing. Um, oh, fascinating. Uh, but, but it's, I mean, that's as far as I got with the drawing because they don't stop for you. It's like, <laughs> just keep going. Uh, but that wonderful fluidity of, mm. um, and, and I was so privileged to be there. And, and it just felt, lovely but you see when people say oh I can't draw well you can draw that it's a stick pan um, but it was about the expression of what they would and the power of what they were doing um, and this is why I talk about vector lines because you can see that the line of movement is a vector line um, mm -hmm. and that's why they come into my work so much um, 
and 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 cross join people up who are thinking together like a lot of my paintings are about people thinking together um but life drawing is is very important and i've always been to life drawing classes um and i i love them so if you do think about doing uh people in your paintings then do go um to the you know locally there's always life drawing um and I I'd, I'd mm -hmm. went to one where they were performing. They they had people with mouse heads and uh, things like that. <laughs> it was such fun. And a lot of the stuff you come back and you think, well, actually, that's rubbish. But it's it's about that journey, isn't it, of getting comfortable with what you're doing. And and I I always feel sad when people come and talk to me and they say, oh, I wish I could do it. You know, oh, I can't because there's no such thing as can't. I, I've had people on my Italian um, week who said, he, um, one man said, I, I haven't um, drawn and painted since I was at school. I said, well, if you've got an open mind and you're ready to have a go, that's all you need. Um, and, and he was just great. He had such a can-do attitude. And by the end of it, he really was motoring, you know? I mean, he, he would never be a great artist. Most of us won't but he was getting so much out of it. And he said, I, I really think I might carry this on later, you know? Um, so I always feel, don't sit there and say, I can't, because you blooming well can. Children, <laughs> I can do it. You know, I've got my grandchildren turn out wonderful pictures. I, I love that. Everything you're saying just reiterates what you're saying about it always being a journey. And even how you say, you know, the last piece mm. that you did, you love, because, you know, mm. so most recent step on your journey and then you keep moving and you obviously push yourself out of your comfort zone like you say with people with like mouse masks on and then you're drawing the ballet which sounds like the most fantastic experience um yes. and it's what you're saying about showing things with a line which obviously comes across really well in your work as it gets more abstract um but yes. that, that that brings me on really really nicely to what i wanted to talk to you about um about you teaching i know you mm. do a lot of teaching as well so could you tell us a bit about that and you know what you do and what you try and get across you obviously got yes. lots of advice for people which is brilliant well, I, I've done periods of teaching throughout my life. Um, what, first of all, I taught some children at school, um, but then I decided that wasn't for me, mainly because I lost too many of them when I took them to the National Gallery. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, no. Um, and then I taught um, college students mm -hmm. um, at Nane College and Amersham College. Um, and that was good because I was teaching design, so I was very comfortable with that. Um, and then um, I've been teaching um, in my studio, one-to-ones, because a lot of people, they have a very specific need. They've got to a plateau or they think they want to try acrylics and never have, or they just want somebody to give them a boost because they haven't painted for a long time. So because I don't have a, a large studio, it's quite small, my studio, um, I prefer to do one-to-one, -one, um, which works well. Um, and we sometimes go out on location and we sit in places like Nyman's. And it's amazing, you know, if you sit there and start to draw, people have to come up to you. It's just, you know, it, it seems like it's a magnet. And, um, and then, of course, I do the teaching in, in uh, Italy. Uh, the weather's better. And um, and of course the wine, <laughs> the wine. Um, and it's it's a holiday as well. Um, but uh, yes, I I mean I I throughout my life I have done quite a bit of teaching. But it it's I just feel that all artists can um, spread their creativity to others, and most of the people I know in places like the Horsham Open Studios are always very willing to do workshops and and take other people into their secrets um, because really we're all just struggling and experimenting and all these other things. You know, I, I remember teaching some children at school some origami and um, uh, paper sculpture uh, and they were just so on it, you know, and they were not children who wanted to paint because paint and brushes wasn't their thing mm -hmm. but um but paper sculpture was and um and there's so many forms even if you just go out and find some leaves and arrange them on a piece of paper i mean it's just do something like that just free yourself is is really what i'm saying 
that, that's wonderful. So it, do you have any pieces of advice that you might give, you know, to some of the people watching and people that are artists themselves? What would be your main piece that you'd say to them? Well, I think for, I mean, I wouldn't like to give advice to other artists because we're all doing different things and we're all on different journeys. I think, well, in a more general way, I'd, I would say try to believe in yourself because we all suffer from um, low belief low self-belief and and we all have days when we think oh this is absolute rubbish what i've done i think the one thing i've learned as i've got older is that you have to be kind to yourself with art um and think well i've done the best i can um and and often the thing that you would have uh, sent to one side and said that was rubbish is something that someone else says actually i quite like that so as far as artists go, I, I'm slightly cautious about um, mouthing my opinions. Um, but I think with the general public, um, I do think that this lockdown and the COVID has made people so much more aware of silence, of nature, of um, the simple things of life, um, mainly because we've got, all got a bit more time. Uh, there's not so much noise going on around our heads uh, and sometimes I'll go out in the garden and I think oh I must do something in the garden and I just see something that lightens my mood and I think art is one of those things that I took my little granddaughter she's six and I took her drawing and I said to her now don't just sit and draw we, we were drawing some boats I said to her don't just draw a boat that you think is a boat because that's what grandma will want you to do actually look at what you're drawing look at that and think what shape is it what shape does it make with the boat next door and do you know she was great and she sat there for about an hour and a half with me we were down on the quay um, and she she was just great and she at the end of it we didn't have anything that we wanted to show anybody it wasn't a work of art but she'd understood and she was starting to think in that way that um, will help her one day to to really appreciate the the shape of things around her um, and, the, and the like sometimes I walk down the street and I think why does everyone look at eye level why don't they look above it at the lovely buildings particularly in London and the shapes of the roofs against each other these wonderful buildings in London and uh, you know, obviously, you need to look where you're going, but at the same time, um, just look beyond the norm and uh, have a little dig around. And it, it, there's a whole life down there, <laughs> up there, down there. Absolutely, and I'm, I'm sure lots of people want to have a you know stronger look at your work um, after this talk as well. So, where's the best place for people to have a look at your work? Is it on your website? Yes, I, I keep my website up to date. It's www.angelabritton.co.uk. Um, and um, I have a Facebook page. And um, yes, and um, Leslie's already put it up for me. She's a mind reader. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so there are some of my latest paintings uh, for this year. Um, you can see that I'm trying to use colour and shape. Um, rather more than t getting too too much detail in. Um, oh, this is your tea uh, one, the one on the left, with the women yeah, having a cup of tea. Yes, that's my tea one, and I've got the actual painting here. It's a watercolour, oh, yes. um, so that is unusual for me. So here we have the. If you, are you getting the shine, or is that all right? No, that, that's, okay. that's good there. I think you're perfect. Yes. So that is um, a reasonable size painting in watercolour um, where I've worked on thick paper um, and kept a, a pretty um, narrow register of colours um, in, in purples, greys and um, a few accent colours. Yeah, because some of my paintings are very, very, paint, very colourful uh, and some of them are more subdued. And I, I like to do that. I like to surprise, really, so that if I have an exhibition, then I've got the bright paintings, the, the ones like this, <laughs> where I've really... Somebody once said to me, there's a lot of red in your paintings. <laughs> well, I suppose there was, but um, yes. But I do like to do 
paintings where I mean that one of the cyclists um, if you oh, can amazing. see that was um, about uh, the um, the cycle race that went mm -hmm. through Yorkshire mm -hmm. um, and um, so I, I, did, I like to vary my palette quite a bit actually um, I mean I this one say, they did these ones. The, the notes carried on the wind which is this one with the cat playing the the piano um, a, a sort of darker painting um, and and different things appeal to different people i mean i get some people who say oh i like your more subdued paintings um and other people i mean I, some people love black and white well it's nothing wrong with black and white um <laughs> but I, for some reason it's like me i go out and try to do a landscape and before long i'll put people in it i can't stop <laughs> myself um yeah so it, it, it i i love love landscapes um but it's not for me and uh, so therefore i don't do them there's other people who are very really really good at landscapes <laughs> so who, who are the um so i have curiosity who, who are the figures in your work do you ever work from a model especially for the features because they they all have something quite in common and i was just yeah. wondering if that is a certain person in your life or if that you know just come like you say just comes from your imagination it's from my imagination um and I started off doing a lot of plump people mm -hmm. because I like plump people. They're usually jolly people. Um, and then uh, now this year, I've been doing some slimmer people. Um, mm -hmm. But the faces are from my imagination and they are, again, a way I'm trying to simplify um, features because the features of the people are not the important thing for me. It's the design of the painting. Um, and the story that it's telling. And the one you just showed um, was called Not Sleeping, Not Awake. And it's about the state you go through when, just before you wake up. You know that bit where you almost feel paralyzed? I, it has mm. some um, um, medical term, um, which I can't, something about nictagoggy or something, where you, you're not, you almost can't move, but you're awake. Mm -hmm. And it's just that bit before you wake up. And that's what that painting is about, where you, you're sort of semi-dreaming. I mean, sometimes I wake up and I'm still in a dream. And I'm jolly glad it's not true because all the teeth have fallen out. You know, <laughs> <is> this, <laughs> <laughs> you know the, the dreams sort of last, don't they, sometimes? Mm. Absolutely. And we've got lots of questions from you. I think people are very interested in that. The first one um, is from Leslie. Oh, Leslie's put para, parasomnia. Is that right? Oh, is that what it is? Is that parasomnia. state between being awake and asleep? Yes, probably. And she's written <laughs> the question saying, um, what place did you first sell your artwork? Was it in galleries or was it somewhere else? Oh, gosh, I'm trying to remember, actually. I've sold a lot of paintings. I think it was a commission, the first one I sold. Uh, I sold quite a lot of commissions um and uh yes i think it was a commission um somebody actually said to me i like that painting can you do me one like it or something mm -hmm. like that i honestly can't remember uh but i i sell my paintings through a, a mixture of mediums i sell them through open studios through galleries um through um submitting my work to um open competitions Mm -hmm. like the Society of Women, well, I belong to the Society of Women Artists now, um, but um, things like the ROI, things like that. Um, and, and so it's a mixture. And then sometimes it's people who know me, friends of friends. And I did a wonderful commission for a couple who met in London and they were foreign. And it was a huge painting of the South Bank. Mm. And... Uh, I've got a copy of it here. It, you can see I went down there for two or three days and um, I was drawing and taking photographs. And I think the thing that really struck me about the South Bank was the noise, the cacophony of noise and activity, men blowing bubbles through hoops 
and a man playing the kettle drums. And then, of course, in the background, you've got things like the um, Millennium Bridge and mm. St Paul's Cathedral. And it wasn't important to me that they were all in the right place. It was important that I got that cacophony of sound and colour. Um, and that atmosphere person. of being there comes the across. To me. Absolutely, yes. Mm. I mean, that was um, a nice that was, that's beautiful. I, I bet they're really, really, mm. really pleased with that. Like you're saying, you've done all that. You, you feel like you're there, just even yes. looking at that. And well, it Annie was to celebrate asked. where they'd met, yes. Yeah. Uh, and it looked amazing on their wall because it was huge. And oh, um, yeah. in, the end, it, in the end of their dining room, it was very striking. Oh, and my dream job, my dream commission would be to, to be asked to do a mural. I love that. I like working big. That would work fantastic. That would be mm. fantastic, wouldn't it? Mm. Oh, yes. yes. Um, Annie asks, do you find one thing grows out of another? You react to your own work. Oh, you react to your own work, the last thing you did. Oh, so do you, do you react to your other works and they obviously grow from each other, each one you do? Um, to some extent and sometimes. Um, I, yes. I mean, if I've had a work that was very popular, um, much as I'd like to honestly say I'm not interested in being popular, if something has been very popular, then it will um, make me do several in that ilk um, because I'm like everyone else. I love to sell my paintings. Um, course, and yeah. so, um, you know, much as I'd like to sort of take the high ground on that, I, I do. But at the same time, I will, at four o'clock in the morning, I'll, I'll be thinking about what am I going to do next? And suddenly into my head comes a thought like, why don't you take yourself to Hampton Court and do some drawing, you know, around Hampton Court? And I think, hey, that's a nice idea. So I get these spurious ideas come into my head. So they don't always follow on from the last thing. Oh, that's wonderful. And are you hoping to do the painting holidays in Italy next year? So in 2021? All things well, it would, you know, hoping. <laughs> well, it would be nice. Yes, I mean, it, who knows what what will happen next year? But uh, yes, it would be nice. And I'm I'm not sure if this um, this question from Fran. She says, "Do you have a fixed daily routine?" And I'm not sure what you're saying about being up at four in the morning, deciding to go to Hampton Court, which sounds fantastic. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, I I do. Um, I mean, I have a a home and and all the things that go with that. And I I think women are. Um, very disciplined if they can say to themselves right nine o'clock in the morning I'm going to be in my studio I can't do that I have to get the jobs out of the way um, make the place tidy make the bed all that sort of miasma of stuff that goes on in life um, and then probably 11 o'clock I come out in my studio every day um, and I work through, I stop for some lunch and then I work through sometimes till seven in the evening, just depends. I mean, if I'm on a roll and I'm up to mirrors and mud and buckets, then that's fine, I'm off. Um, but um, I do every day go in my studio, yes. Fantastic. And um, do you have a favourite medium? I know you mentioned, and Lizzie's put here, oil, acrylic, pastels. Um, and do, do you have a favourite one? The, that piece you showed us was a watercolour. Um, and why is that your favourite? Uh, no, it's not my favourite. Watercolour. Oh, so I, I <laughs> is anyone who's good at watercolours, uh, they have my full admiration. Um, no, my, my preferred medium is oils. I love the, the sort of, the way you can push them around and the way the colours stay so bright. I, I love oils. Um, the, you do get very messy. Um, I, I was laughed at once when I, I went along to an oil painting session and she said, oh, for goodness sake, wear some rubber gloves if you don't like getting messy. Um, but I, I do find that acrylic's easier. Um, and the reason I find them easier is because I, I like layering a lot mm. and you, they will dry. Um, whereas oils, you can get muddy so quickly. They fight um, back a bit, don't they? <laughs> they absolutely, yes. Um, so I would say if you're a reasonably amateur painter or if, I mean, some people love acrylics um, and they don't want to do anything else, that's fine. But if you're starting out on a journey, you will find acrylics a lot easier than oils. Um, but um, I, I like oils. I feel like a real painter when I'm using oils. <laughs> it's the smell. 
<laughs> it's that, isn't it? It's that turp smell. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Annie's also mentioned here of whether you've tried the, she says, thick oil bars. She says, for simpler drawings, have oh. you tried the thick oil bars? They can be clumsy, but wonderful qualities within the medium if you rub them with turps. I've not seen them, I don't think. I've seen them, but I've not used them. I mean, there's so many different things and they're quite expensive when you have to get all the colours and, mm. and all that. No, I, I haven't tried them, no. Um, and did you do an art journal during lockdown? Did you find you had to like record what you were doing or was that? No, I carried on working. Um, I, I've, I felt very inspired. Um, I was quite, yes, I was quite um, chugging along during um all the lockdown i i it was the peace and the quiet i think and i found the ideas were flowing and i've i've done about 10 paintings in th this year um i generally do about 10 or 12 paintings a year um just depending but i don't i don't want to just fill my paintings up with my studio up with paintings i'm i, I try to be a little bit uh, um i think a little bit harder about what I'm going to do. I mean, I, that's not to say I wouldn't in between do some drawing and, and some sketching and stuff like that, but uh, I try not, mainly because I'd have to find a bigger studio. <laughs> yeah, it's still I started painting over some of them. <laughs> and um, you've, met, you've mentioned a few different names um, during the interview, but um, have you got any influences? Who are your big influence in the art world? Yes, I, I should have been born in the 1930s, I think, um, because there, there's a lot of painters around then that I, I really love. Um, and I think I think it's because they have a graphic quality um, is, is why I like them. And, um, you know, it's, it, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's difficult for me to um, uh, feel comfortable with, um, for instance, the great masters. I mean, I found out some time ago that I was um, related to Sel Cotman. Now, Sel mm -hmm. Cotman, for those who don't know, is a watercolorist, um, and he lived in Norwich. And he, he, my name before I was married was Sel, and he, his name is uh, on all the um, Derwent colors, um, the, the watercolors. Um, and I went to the museum in Norwich um, and I saw his lovely, absolutely fantastic Victorian watercolours and I absolutely fell in love with them. I mean, they're out of fashion now, Victorian watercolours, but when you think that they had no, uh, no way of going out taking lots of photographs as we do now, digital photographs and then using those, they were doing it from all their sketches and and i i i love his work i i could never ever um do that sort of work um but they are a huge influence on me um and um obviously in the early days ken howard i loved his painting against the light um and the, his use of light i wrote to him my only ever fan mail um <laughs> and i said to him how much i loved his work and what a great man that he wrote, hand wrote a letter back to me from Mausel, where he had his place in, in uh, uh, down by the coast. And he just, I said to him, I don't think I'd ever be anything like as good as you. And he said, just keep practicing. Don't lose heart, just keep practicing. And I just thought that was so lovely that a man of that reputation could take the time to write to me like that you know and um and he is a, a phenomenal painter um and but not my style of course and i would never dream of going there um well i did in the early days but not now um but i think the people who have had the biggest influence on me have been the people with a slightly more graphic twist um and like goga um, who was very, very early. Once he hit his stride and he went out to the Polynesian island, I think he suddenly he knew what he was doing. And I feel as if I'm getting there a little bit, that I feel as if I'm hitting my stride um, of what I want to do. And that's slightly reassuring um, that I feel I'm um, making a journey still, but I can feel where the journey's going. 
That's really wonderful. That's lovely. Oh, that's, so, that's so nice that someone that, like you say, you look up to so much, actually did the handwritten letter back to you. I know. That's so wonderful. Special. Do you still yes, have it? I must still have it. <laughs> I've, got, I've got the letter and I have one of his paintings, but um, I, I treasure. Yes, if there's a fire, it's the first thing I'll grab. <laughs> and Leslie's joined us back on screen, which is Hello. Hello. I thought that was absolutely wonderful. Wonderful. I really loved the the tea time painting mm. and the, oh, yes. the not quite asleep, mm. not quite awake painting as well. I think they're just mm. they're so they're so romantic as well. There's an essence of the romantic and the ethereal in them that kind of draws you in. Yes, I, I am a romantic. I don't know why, but I am. And I, I believe in the goodness of man still. Yeah. <laughs> Despite how life pushes you around. Yes, I yeah. believe there is um, there is love and, and goodness in everybody. And I, and I think um, I always want to, as I say, my paintings, a lot of them are about women and the way they get on together and how they support each other. Um, and I think that is so important that women do that. You know, it's it's uh, one of my um, hobby horses that I think women should support each other. Um, well, we're good on this screen, aren't we? There's three of us. <laughs> we're all there. Yeah. And we're all there. I love that. It's women and cats. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> women and cats, because there's a lot of cats yeah. in there. Ted's not with me today, sadly. Oh, <laughs> I put him in the I put him in the house today because he's been a bit naughty. He went into next door. So, we, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Ted got into well, trouble today. Everyone will be wondering where Ted is. So, yeah, I, oh. that's what I thought. And I love the colour, the saturation of colour. And as you say, for me, the that oil, um, it's worth the fight, isn't it? It is. It's worth, it is. The, it's worth the battle because mm -hmm. you get something Absolutely. so amazing. I asked this question of Richard the other day, and I will ask it of you. Do you put a ground colour down behind or do you just go straight on? You do. I and mean, do you have a favourite colour? It depends. If I'm doing warm colours, then it will be a sort of um, an ochre mm. um, as the ground. But I also um, do colour opposites underneath. Um, for instance, if I have a large area um, of red, then I'll often do green underneath. Mm -hmm. um, and I do that to make the colour zap a bit. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, the more I can actually slap on the thing before I actually get the drawing on it, <laughs> The less inhibited I feel, I can't look mm. at a big white canvas, it just inhibits me. Um, and it really doesn't matter what you slap down underneath. And I had a lady come to me who was doing botanical drawing and she was very talented. And she said to me, oh, I want to learn to do acrylics. Um, and um, the first thing I got her to do was slap orange all over the canvas. <laughs> and she was very unhappy and out of her comfort zone. But we started to bring it back. We started to bring the drawing back. We started to bring the colors back. And she she started to relax. Um, and I think that's often key to, to starting a painting. Don't feel as if every stroke you put down has got to be your last. You know, just get comfortable. Yeah, comfort zone is a thing, isn't it? We have to go into the stretchy bit. Get into <laughs> yeah. the stretchy bit. And we're always, you know, don't go stress, but you know, if you get into the stretch of it, that's where the magic happens. Yes, it does. I love the magic. If, yes, we, stay in the, if we stay in the comfort zone, we get what we expect. Yes, yes, definitely. This is why I like to draw big and, and, and then reduce it down because wonderful things can happen if you draw with your left hand, if you shut your eyes, you know, just stop being, feeling so uptight about it. But I fought that. I, I really have fought that um, because I suppose it, if you're hanging on to your picture, you feel, you know, I've got a little sketch here of the beginnings of the, the painting I said you got in the Sunday Times Best of British Watercolour. Now, that was my snug at home. And you see how tight that was. Yeah. But that's how I started, you see. Um, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's great. But if that's what you want to do, 
Mm. Mm. It's it's a mm. starting point, isn't it? And like you say, you mm. know, we're all equally logical and creative. It just depends which part of the muscle we decide to develop. So we've yeah. all got the potential there, haven't we, to develop the creative yes. muscle. And everyone yeah. can, if you can pick up a pencil. Some obviously there are some people who can't, but most of us can pick up a um, pencil. And and it's just practice, Patch, mm. practice, and being prepared to chuck yourself in. And I love that about you, your spirit of, let's just get up to our armpits in it. That was the thing when you mm. said that. If I'm I'm muddy, <laughs> I'm in there. Yeah. I'm in the fight. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It is sometimes like a fight, isn't it, with the paintings? Yes. But you are an absolutely superb painter. And uh, oh, I have massive you. admiration <laughs> for you sticking with the fight because the some of those paintings that we looked at today are absolutely beautiful. And uh, if you want to uh, contact Angela, her contact details are, we've got the Read Art 360 magazine button for those who are watching Crowdcast now. Anyone who's watching on playback, uh, you can go onto the what uh, the read page on the Pure Arts Group website and all her contact details are there. Anyone who's watching us on Facebook, I know there's been lots of people watching on Facebook and some of the comments that I was putting in and what um, other people were asking. Um, and also my questions as well, because I can't sit down there quietly <laughs> asking nothing. <laughs> I've, got one, I've got one other place where you can see what I've been up to. Go on, and tell us. Uh, right, the artist magazine, this September issue has got an article by me with step by step of how I did the painting called um, uh, Sunny Sunny Faces and Sandy Toes, something like that. Lovely. And it's a step by step on, on two spreads in that magazine. So tell us uh, the name, not, of, na name of the magazine the, again. The, the Artist Magazine. The Artist it's Magazine. The Yes, yeah, the same people who do artist and painter. Right, I was going to say, I've yeah. heard of artist and painter, so this is the mm. artist magazine. Great. Mm. And that will be in all WH Smith's <laughs> yeah. near you. I and think I'm so. Sure, and I'm sure you yeah. can buy it online as well. So thank you so much, Angela. You've shared so much with us. Really well done, Molly. Welcome back. <laughs> Save my throat so I'm not going to be hoarse by the end of this. You've been yes, brilliant. Thank you, Molly. Both of you have been brilliant, and um, um, it's been a great, a great interview, and lots of um, questions from the audience, which was great. And tomorrow, you're doing going to be interviewing Nick Hepditch. Yes, yes, yeah. so I'm really, really excited. Nick yeah. has had his hair cut, everyone. The announcement of the day. So <laughs> he isn't going to be the the man with the massive hair that you can see in the magazine. He has had a haircut. So thank you so much. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Molly, and we'll see everyone, same time, same place, here tomorrow. tomorrow. All right. <laughs> Thank Bye you. For Bye. Now. Bye for now. <laughs>